Okay, so for today's lecture, we're going to talk about how the ocean and the atmosphere are connected to climate. The ocean-atmosphere connection uh, will also, I'll, I'll talk about that also when we get to the, the chapters on current climate change and on future climate change, but we just want to do the basics for right now. So here's an important fact, and that is that almost all of the heating that we have generated through our global warming has gone into the oceans. 93% has gone into the oceans. Most of that's in the top 700 meters, uh, two-thirds of it, and uh, the remainder, most of that's in the next 1,300 meters down below. Has it raised the ocean temperature very much? No, it really hasn't, and that's because the thermal capacitance of water is so much higher than it is for either soil or for the atmosphere. And the reason for that is because water is a polar molecule with one side net positive and the opposite side net negative, and it's made of a molecule that has two different kinds of atoms in it, and therefore it has lots of internal degrees of freedom that can absorb energy without raising the kinetic energy of the entire molecule itself. And we remember in our chapter on the nature of heat that uh, temperature is actually a measure of the kinetic energy of the external motion of the particles, not the energy stored internally in vibrational modes. So having high thermal capacitance means that water can absorb a lot of heat without changing its temperature very much. And it can also, just in the same way, give off a lot of heat without changing its temperature much. Uh, the thermal capacitance of the air, on the other hand, is quite a bit uh, less. And the reason for that is because it's dominated by diatomic molecules. So nitrogen and oxygen diatomic molecules don't have anywhere near as many uh, internal degrees of freedom, internal motions which can absorb the collisional energy that could uh, that will happen with just being in a dense medium. So that means that the energy added to the atmosphere goes more directly into increasing its temperature. So that's what we mean by low thermal capacitance. You add energy and it gets reflected right away in increased temperature. Not so much with water. Okay, Observational data as of 2016 indicate that the ocean surface is warm by only about 0.6 centigrade. So that's a little bit, uh, uh, well that's quite a bit less than um, the total land, ocean, and cryosphere, the uh, poles. Uh, surface temperature is warm, which is about 1.2 as of 2016. Of course, now it's up closer to 1.4. Still, the oceans have warmed uh, less, about half of what the land and sea average have done. So this is a map. There's a very similar looking graph of the land surface temperatures, but this is ocean surface temperatures. And look at the numbers here. They're quite a bit lower than you're going to see later as we talk about the evolution of surface temperatures in general. This is just global sea surface temperature. So you'll see this abbreviation SST. So that means sea surface temperature. So another way to look at this is that the ocean's thermal mass is about 700 times bigger than the thermal mass of the atmosphere. So the entire thermal capacity of the atmosphere is equivalent to just the top 12 feet of the ocean. The rest of the three and a half kilometers of ocean uh, are on top of that. That's why this is such a big number, 700 times. So because 93% of our heating has gone into the oceans, then it's possible to do a calculation, including the thermal capacitance, and ask, well, what would the temperature of our atmosphere be if all of the greenhouse warming due to that atmosphere had remained in our atmosphere, and the answer you get is it would be about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's 68 degrees Fahrenheit warmer now, that's added on top of whatever the average temperature is, which is roughly globally about 53 degrees. 
So you add those together, it would mean that the average temperature around the whole Earth in the atmosphere at the surface would be about 120 Fahrenheit. So, of course, we'd all be dead. Now, we're going to see a little later, in fact, at the end, um, that this has its good side and its bad side. So the good side is it sort of saved us from ourselves. The bad thing is that it is, um, you know, energy is conserved and ain't going away and there's only one place for that energy to go and that's back out into outer space. And therefore, if we try to cool the atmosphere above the ocean, the oceans are going to warm it right back up. So what about the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere? Uh, surprisingly little uh, when you think about rainstorms and how much water they can dump. That's only over a tiny area of the globe per small units of time. And in fact, if you take the whole atmosphere, on average, there's only about one inch of water vapor, one inch of liquid water in terms of water vapor averaged around the globe. Now, that's very dependent on the temperature. So as the temperature goes up, then this is the clausius clapeyron uh, relation that we talked about before. So if you raise the temperature by one degree centigrade, then you raise the ability of the atmosphere to hold water vapor by 22 percent. And so if you get all the way up to 120 Fahrenheit, which is the temperature that we would be at if all of our greenhouse heating had gone and remained only in the atmosphere, then water vapor would make up 4 percent of the mass of the atmosphere, which is pretty large. Of course, it's quite a bit less than that today. Okay, another key fact is that the ocean because of this huge thermal mass, it responds to forcings very, very slowly. Uh, it's, it's not only the thermal mass, it's also because it mixes very slowly and is very deep. Um, on average, the ocean's well mixed in the summer only over the top 20 meters of depth, so that's about 70 feet. And only over the top 90 meters, even in winter, when storm turbulence will uh, increase that. To, uh, that increase that 20 up to about 90. So for a 90 meter mixing depth, the ocean takes fully six years to reach some sort of equilibrium to a temperature change at the surface. That's a surprisingly large number. Now if you want to mix the entire ocean all the way down to the bottom, now you have to wait for the global thermohaline, in other words heat and salt thermohaline driven ocean current to complete a full cycle and that takes actually as long as 1,000 years. Much longer. So the reason for that is because the thermocline, this is a region in the ocean where the temperature goes from being pretty warm on top to being pretty cold for most of the depth of the ocean and because you have warm water on top and less dense water on top of denser, colder water. It's a very stable boundary and there's only a couple of places in the northern hemisphere where you can actually get the ocean currents to penetrate that and go down to the bottom. Two places in the north, two places in the south. So that's a total of four places around the world. We'll look at those in a minute. So there's the thermocline. So Near the surface, temperatures are pretty warm, about 23 degrees centigrade on average. Then there's a steep cooling that happens over just about, well, really less than a, a thousand meters. And then below that, the temperature's only about four, three, maybe two degrees centigrade above, above uh, freezing. So most of the ocean is, uh, is quite cold in terms of its mass. So these are some of the currents as seen in a vertical sense. You get heat loss from the ocean here near the poles and that cools the water and allows it to get cold enough in winter especially to penetrate the thermocline. Basically the thermocline goes away in these special places and then the water can sink and get all the way down to the bottom and then it transmits slowly across the earth to the equator um, and completes the cycle that we'll look at later. But uh, because the, you know, of course the land doesn't move, but the water does move, and so that allows 
for a much better distribution of the warming which is focused at the equator from the sun to be distributed up towards the poles where now it's the ocean that's warmer than the atmosphere and it can uh, radiate and evaporate that to uh, the atmosphere. If you really want to look at the currents, of course, they get on a small scale uh, more complicated. So there's actually Antarctic bottom water going this way and then North Atlantic deep water going that way and then Antarctic intermediate water going that way and then some surface water that's, you know, that's separate that's up here. Um, nevertheless, we can really get a good feel for the total ocean currents by just looking at a nice map like this. So the surface currents are the red, the deep currents are the blue, and then the bottom currents are purple. So those are the ones along the, mostly along the Antarctic here. Now these are the two places I was talking about that are off of Greenland. So one of them is uh, just north of Iceland and the other one just south of the tip of Greenland. And this is where the the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current, that's the current that basically moves north along the Atlantic because the Atlantic is a pretty much north-south uh, snaking ocean. And uh, up here, these two yellow spots is where the uh, the water gets cold enough and saline and dense enough that it can actually uh, remove the thermo thermocline and fall down to the bottom. There's two more places in the south and they're on opposite sides of the Palmer Peninsula where the uh, uh, ice shelves are having such trouble lately. Um, and there's, So there's one there and there's another one over here. These are going to turn out to play um, a key role in relatively near-term climate change future. Yeah, so uh, what happens is, um, well, what's happening is that because Greenland is melting rapidly, uh, that's causing surface waters to get fresher, meaning more purely just H2O. Of course, it's the salt, it's the sodium and the chlorine, which are much heavier atoms than, uh, than hydrogen and, and oxygen that give seawater its higher density. So w even though the water coming off of Greenland is cold, because it's fresh, it ends up uh, sitting on top. And it forms a, a deepening layer of fresh water that's very stable and does not want to, to go down, to get dense enough to go down. It's also acting as a cap and inhibiting the ability of the, the warmer water underneath to get rid of its heat. It's basically a, an insulating layer. Even though it's a cold layer, it's an insulating layer because, uh, because of the stability due to the density change. Uh, fresher water is um, resistant to mixing with the salt water. So what that means is the warm surface waters have to go farther north before they're able to get cold enough to finally sink. So that's one effect. Okay, and this warmth going farther north accelerates the Arctic ice melt, which is the whole source of the problem here. So it's a positive climate feedback. It's a positive feedback on this uh, cap of less dense fresh water that is inhibiting the cooling of the North Atlantic. And as another result of this, the, uh, the AMOC current is, would be expected but through just some pure theory to be slowing and in fact it is slowing. So we'll look at a graph and it shows that the AMOC, so we'll just call it the AMOC, um, has weakened already by 17 percent, much larger than climate models had predicted earlier. And as new studies come out we're seeing that the odds that it may shut down altogether keep getting higher. So it is predicted to accelerate with further climate change. Um, now, there's, there's several effects with this, and one interesting one has to do with the Coriolis force. So we remember when we looked at planets in general how the Coriolis force will cause a rightward motion as you are going from larger rotational velocities near the equator to 
migrating north going towards um, slower rotational velocities. Of course, at the pole, your rotational velocity is zero. Uh, and what that means is there is this artificial rightward force that therefore makes for higher sea levels along the um, eastern sides of the ocean and for um, lower sea levels along the westward sides. You, the, the ocean acquires a bit of a tilt because of this Coriolis force. But if the AMOC is weakening and the flow is flow velocity is weakening, then that will reverse that to some extent. And that an artificial higher sea level rise on the western side of the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, the western side of the Atlantic Ocean is the eastern seaboard of the United States. And so we can expect several extra inches and as much as a full meter of additional sea, li uh, additional sea level rise, quite apart from anything having to do with the rising uh, temperature of the water and therefore the lowering density or the melting of all that ice. This is just a Coriolis force effect. So sea level rise is expected to be worse along the uh, eastern coast of uh, North America as things get get warmer and less severe in uh, Europe. So well, nice thing I guess for Europe. Uh, okay this is the subpolar gyre minus the northern hemisphere average and it's a decent proxy for the strength of the Atlantic Meridional overturning current. And so you can see and, and this we have measurements for through indirect means with sediments and so forth. Um, that it looks pretty stable. There's a bit of a wiggle here during the Little Ice Age, um, but you can see that now heading into the fossil fuel era that we're getting a significant uh, weakening. We did have a rise back up here, but we're heading back down again now. And then these are predictions of uh, what we expect the AMOC to do up to the year 2100 and you can see that it's uh, expected to go through pretty much a straight line down. This is uh, five years old. I haven't seen a, a more recent uh, version of this but if I see one I'll, I'll stick it in. Now the real question and something that we should legitimately be afraid of is does the AMOC have a tipping point where it could actually shut down altogether and work has shown that in fact it does. Uh, Lenton et al. in 2008 shows that below a certain strength the, AM the AMOC will break down entirely. It goes past a tipping point in the salinity and uh, and then it just stops. Uh, in, in fact we're going to see a graph later that shows that we're in a regime right now where it is uh, this, the strength of the current now and the salinity now are such that there are two stable states for the AMOC. One of them is the state that it's actually in where it is still moving but the other stable state is for it to be stopped altogether and as we continue on the path that we're on we expect that we will hit a tipping point and we'll fall past and we'll head into a static stagnant ocean which will have uh, large consequences. Um, yeah, so uh, a more recent than this paper, and, and Romstorff and Hoffman paper, uh, 16 climatologists who are specialists in this area gave odds of more like 40 percent given strong global warming of a, up to plus 6C, which is possible uh, given what we're doing, quite possible actually. Uh, a bit, bit, almost a 50-50 chance of shutting down the AMOC. That would be bad. It would be many centuries before it could get going again, no matter what we did, no matter no matter how dramatic you tried to reverse climate change. Once it's broken down, um, it's not going to get going again for any time in the foreseeable future. So what would be the consequences of a slowed or halted AMOC? Of course, we talked about this. Uh, of course, there'd be a rise in sea level from warmer waters in the mid and low latitudes. So that's apart from the Coriolis force effect. The 
equatorial waters would now not be distributing their heat to the higher latitudes and so you would end up with much stronger hurricanes and much stronger warming near the surface ocean and therefore higher sea level as well. You would also induce an ocean that was now severely depleted in oxygen because it is surface oxygen which goes into the surface oceans that slowly, very slowly, makes its way down to the deep ocean and prevents the deep ocean from being entirely anoxic. If the deep ocean does go anoxic, then you can encourage uh, anaerobic species that generate hydrogen sulfide. Um, and in fact, Peter Ward, a paleontologist, thinks that uh, this is a uh, um, very high on the list of suspects for the great mass extinctions that we've had in the past. Um, and then here I'm just comparing how rock and soil also have much lower heat capacitance, only about a quarter of that of uh, of ocean water, and it's because partly because it's a solid, uh, doesn't mix very well. Um, yeah, only about two meters is all it takes for the entire annual, daily and annual, temperature variance to be damped out. So if you go deeper than about seven feet into the ground, then the temperature down there is basically constant. If you go over much longer time frames, so now if you want to go many, many decades and centuries, then of course uh, that will penetrate deeper. Um, I almost removed this because it's gotten so old. This is 2003 data, but I, I do like the fact that it's showing the energy content now. So this is actually in joules. Uh, so that's a different measure than looking at temperature. And this is the energy content change in the, uh, well, it's portioned out here, but let's maybe look at the total down at the bottom here. Um, for the period from, let's see, what was this, 1950, I think? Um, yeah, I think 19... Uh, last 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 years. So 40 years before 2003, so 1960 or so. Um, this is the total change, but this is just the most recent of the 10 years. So this is 1993 to 2003. Most of the change has happened in just the last 10 of those 40 years. So this is really dramatic acceleration of the heat content going into these these Earth systems. Um, this is also a, a nice dramatic graph. It shows how much of the total heat content that we have added by global warming, our greenhouse gases, has gone into the land and the atmosphere and the ice. Small compared to how much has gone into the oceans. So again, 93% has gone into the oceans. And this graph just shows that most of it's gone into the surface layers. So I'm not going to pause on this one very long. Uh, the rate at which the heat goes in is uh, a bit like a pig and a snake, python, pig and a python, I guess is the phrase. So there are these so-called hiatus periods when the ocean heat content um, on the surface layers uh, is, is quite different than in the deep layers. And so periods global warming of the atmosphere is not happening very strongly. But look at what's happening at the total ocean. So during the hiatus decades, actually it's stronger heating into the deeper ocean. So these are 300 to 750 meters depth and then this is 750 meters further down. So basically these hiatus periods are just periods when the heat transmission from the surface layers into the deeper layers, layers <coughs> is more efficient. And being more efficient it prevents the surface layers from being excessively hot and therefore heating the atmosphere excessively. It's when you get uh, out of these hiatus decades that you have the strongest surface warming in the atmosphere.
Um, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is um, is an oscillation that's defined strictly by sea surface temperatures. It's it's not defined by ocean currents or surface winds like uh, the El Nino, which is more uh, more complex. This is strictly a temperature cycle, and there were people who were confused and thinking that this might be the cause of global warming just because there's a correlation there. But um, <laughs> just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that the cause and effect goes from the ocean to the atmosphere. In fact, uh, global warming is going from the atmosphere into the ocean, so it's the ocean that's absorbing the atmosphere, the, the, the uh, heat of the atmosphere. And I spend probably more time than I really need to anymore in debunking that here, just because um, always uh, good to debunk the climate deniers. Um, the actual cause of global warming, of course, is long-lived greenhouse gases. That's the red curve here. But we're going to talk more about this graph later, so I'm just going to skip over it. Um, this is the AMO with a simple linear trend removed. So if you just take out the linear trend, then there is no trend. Okay. Um, the linear trend is the trend that you can apportion to global warming caused by uh, actually more than linear exponential rise in CO2 and in water vapor. Um, now what we're doing here is we're looking at the global sea surface temperatures, but we're subtracting the North Atlantic sea surface temperatures. And when you do that, then you see there's no trend. So again, we're debunking this old idea. Somehow it made it past the referees and got into publication. I'll be kind and not mention the authors. Um, in fact, here's global sea surface temperatures with and without the North Atlantic that defines this uh, AMO. And you can see they're virtually identical, so it's a very, very minor effect. Whether it's whether cause and effect went one way or the other doesn't really matter. Um, okay, this is showing now something a little more interesting and complex and more climate significant, and that's the El Nino. The El Nino Southern Oscillation is a ENSO cycle is the more formal way to talk about it, but <clears throat> in common language, of course, you've all heard it as just El Nino. So what is the El Nino, and then what is its counterpart, the La Nina periods? So the La Nina periods are when we have strong trade winds, <clears throat> and they're blowing the equatorial waters westward. So blowing the equatorial waters westward will drive cold upwelling off of South America, where the equator is, and that will cool the equatorial waters as that cool water then gets pulled along on the equator. The El Nino happens when, when the La Nina has gone on so long that all those warm, well, the waters initially come up off of South America and they're cold because they're coming up from deeper. But as they slowly, again slowly, takes years, are driven by the winds across the surface equator, of course, the equator is where it's pretty hot on the surface, you know, 80, 90 degrees. And so what happens is those waters get warmer and warmer. And when they finally get over to Indonesia and Borneo, then they pile up. And as they pile up, then the parts of the water that communicate with the air and are warm and could therefore communicate that heat to the atmosphere um, are getting buried underneath other warm layers. So it's it's kind of getting a little bit more of a vertical thing to it, and that can be as much as a foot deep uh, over this large area. Then what happens is finally the trade winds slacken off because, you know, it's a not chaotic, but it's a kind of a semi-chaotic system. So when the trade winds finally weaken, then all that warm water feels itself gravitationally wanting to flow right back across the equatorial uh, waters of the Pacific. 
And as they do the as they do that, then all the warm waters which had been buried underneath other warm water when it was off Indonesia, as it sloshes back, it's going to now have a large surface area that it can communicate that heat to the atmosphere. And so El Nino periods correspond to times of enhanced global warming. So there's a nice diagram. So here we're blowing the trade winds from South America, which is on the, the right side here, across the Pacific and over to Indonesia. The El Nino conditions happen when the blowing of the trade winds is quite a bit weaker, and now what ends up ruling the day is the gravitational effect of all this piled up hot water, and it then flows right back. Here, let me use my little red marker. It then flows right back this way, and now spreading all that heat out across the large area and able to, to warm the atmosphere. So the colors here are meant to show the temperature anomaly, in other words, the temperature difference from the long-term average, not the ab absolute temperature. And so during El Nino conditions, you see all this warm water that had been piled up here has now flowed west and is now much warmer over all this area than it used to be. That enhanced area of warm water um, also is along the west coast, so we here in California, we realize that El Nino's is also a nice time to go swimming because the cold current coming down from Alaska is not quite as cold and it's actually uh, can be kind of nice. So the periods between El Ninos, I said here very roughly five years. It's so non-periodic, I almost wish I hadn't put anything in, but it's certainly longer than a year. Um, not usually as long as 10 years, but it can be almost anything in between those two numbers. So why is it so long? Well, the reason it's so long is because the Pacific is so big, and the natural frequency of sloshing back and forth is longer than for any other ocean. The much smaller Indian Ocean doesn't show that kind of a cycle because it's small enough that the sloshing basically has a period of about one year. and That resonates very nicely with the seasonal cycle and so what you get in the Indian Ocean instead is very strong monsoons followed by dry periods, dry seasons. But there, that's an annual cycle, and the El Nino is not an annual cycle. Oh uh, boy, yeah, so um, one of the climate denialists' favorite uh, strategy for quite a while was starting their temperature records at the beginning of 1998, when we had the strongest El Nino in uh, modern history. See, then you can start your supposed temperature graph at the very peak and then go forwards for a decade or so and say look no more global warming cherry picking is what we call that okay now this is the PDO is also climate significant and this is a longer term oscillation um, you know it's almost like the analogy I'm going to pick with the Sun. So remember when we looked at the Sun, we talked briefly about the Sun in this class because it does influence climate of course, um, and how there's an 11 year sunspot cycle, but then there also seems to be a 100 year cycle that uh, modulates the intensity of the 11 year sunspot cycle. And so the PDO I think is probably an analog of that. This is a this is semi-periodic oscillation. It's not really decadal, but it's very roughly decadal in the Pacific currents. And it's actually caused by a whole bunch of things, so we could get lost in all the complexities. I don't really want to do that. But here's the PDO when it's in its cold mode, and more of the surface of the Pacific is cooler than average, and the places that are warmer than average are, are pretty small in area. And then it's the opposite of that during the warm, the warm modes. So the PDO index is defined as the excess average sea surface temperature in the North Pacific after removing the monthly global mean sea surface temperature. So we're removing the global sea surface temperature 
long-term trends and therefore clearly can't be invoked as a cause of global warming. It can explain periods when you have excess rates of warming and then excess, well, not excess, but I suppose excess rates of uh, staying constant. PDO is definitely involved in that. Purple slide, I'm going to move right on. Okay, this is a more fun slide. So here's the PDO over the last thousand years. Again, we don't have direct measurements of everything we'd really love. Um, so we use proxies for tree ring data and so forth. And this shows um, cool phases. And here. Cool phases, pretty strong cool phases, lasting quite a while. Um, more typical of the length of phases we have these days here. Warm phases, cool phase, warm phase, long warm phases here. And so these big chunks of time that last for 20 odd years, 10, 20 years, longer than the El Nino cycle are considered uh, manifestations of the PDO. So let's just notice as we eventually are going to look at this a little more closely later that in the period from about 1960 to 1980 we were in a PDO cool period and that definitely did inhibit the ability of the atmosphere to get warmed by the constantly rising CO2. Then we're in a warm period and then this doesn't show it here, but then we're in another PDO cool period that lasted for another 16 or 17 years after 1999. And now we're back out of that and we're back into a warm period, which we assume uh, is probably going to last and that would then be a PDO warm period. So now we're zoomed in a little more. Now we're just looking at the last not the last thousand years, but just the last 150 years. And now, the nice thing is you see this goes forward. So the last PDO cool period we saw was this one, and then I said it, um, we had a little bit of warmth again, and then we went into another PDO cool period here. And now we've come back out of it. So that's this last bit here, and this begins about 2015. So the last five years we've been in a PDO warm period, and we've been in a period of very rapid global warming at the surface. Um, so what this is showing is that the proxies that we use for the PDO seem to be pretty good. As you notice, the proxies that we use are calibrated against better measures here in the last 60 or 70 years. And they fit pretty well. Okay, here's the PDO index it goes up, it goes down, goes up, it goes down. The global temperatures, however, have been going up. But I do want you to notice, look at how this period here, beginning about 1945 or so, temperatures on Earth went through a period of not going up before they resumed again. The PDO index was going into a cool period during that time. So no doubt that was part of it. The, there's more reasons for the global temperature anomaly here and that have to do with smog and aerosols. We'll come to that later. Okay, what about the chemical aspect? So here's the chemical aspect that's most relevant and that is the fact that when CO2 from the atmosphere here soaks into the ocean then it combines with water to make carbonate. But because you have uh, excess uh, carbonic acid, the hydrogen ions that are floating around will um, compete for that carbonate and they'll make this uh, bicarbonate, uh, these bicarbonate ions. And that leaves the carbonate unavailable to sea life to use it to combine with calcium to make their seashells. Okay, so CO2 plus water vapor, uh, excuse me, 
Well, CO2 plus water vapor will make water droplets, raindrops, which have excess uh, carbonic acid, and that does fall into the ocean. But either way, however it gets in through raindrops or just direct surface um, contact with the, uh, the air, either way, it ends up making carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then has hydrogens floating free, and those combine with the carbonate ions to make bicarbonate, and now the bicarbonate is not available to make these guys. In fact, um, you might even get these guys, their precious little shells, dissolving. And uh, we're beginning to see that, in fact, uh, in order to go into making this bicarbonate. We're going to see much later, one of the proposed solutions is to somehow dump enough bicarbonate into the ocean to, um, to prevent this imbalance from, from happening. But it doesn't look feasible as any kind of a global solution. But maybe over very small regions it can help. Uh, okay, so this is just kind of a nice stability graph. Uh, pH is a, is a measure of the free hydrogen ions. And high number means alkaline or basic. And low numbers means acidic. And unfortunately, we're heading this way. And this way means we have less of these carbonate ions that are available for the sea life to use. Okay, So the, the black curve is going down in the range in which we have been moving. And we've moved about this amount. It's about, uh, you know, it's a quite a large, about 30, more than 30% change in the acidity of the ocean. So I'm going to let you click on those on your own. But uh, just to note that the current rate of change of the ocean's pH is 100 times faster than at any time in the last few hundred thousand years, according to the records that we have. Qu quite possibly unprecedented in all of Earth's history. Remember, for future reference, that extinctions are caused when change happens rapidly. Slow changes, species can modify, change, new species develop, uh, genetically um, transform themselves even. But when you have rapid change, then species can't adapt at all and you end up with mass extinctions. Okay, This is a graph going back to 1940 and it shows us the CO2 in the atmosphere, that's the the red curve here, that's CO2 in the atmosphere, the Keeling curve, accelerating upwards. CO2 partial pressure um, against the ocean, going therefore into the ocean, causes seawater to get more acidic. So this is the uh, acid, the alkalinity rather, the seawater pH um, is dropping. All right. Uh, this is much more recent data. This only goes back to 1990, and this shows the seasonal cycles. So uh, CO2 goes into the atmosphere and out according to as trees, you know, grow new leaves and then shed leaves and, you know, the seasonal cycle. And you can see those reflected in the pH of the ocean. So there's a direct correlation with the pH of the ocean. So pretty clear what's going on here. And it's not good. Um, I'm not really going to require you to know these three uh, uh, CO2 pumps, as they're called, um, except in just a very general way, and that is that I do want you to know that the solubility of CO2 into the ocean gets worse. The ability of the ocean to hold CO2 gets worse as the water gets warmer. I think we already uh, told you that. Quest gave you a quiz question on that, in fact, last quiz. Um, but then there's another, and that is the ability of sea life to take that CO2 and, in the form of carbonate, combine it with calcium, and do mineralization and make their seashells. And when you get remineral, excuse me, when you get um, upwelling from deep layers, which are colder and therefore able to dissolve some of that,
then you can get CO2 going back into the atmosphere. Um, and that's that's really described by both both of these on the right here. Okay, here's the pH in the Caribbean Sea. Just 20 years from here to here, quite a bit more um, acidic or less alkaline, to be more precise. And with the kind of shifts that we're seeing, we expect that aragonite forming species of coral, which is almost all of them, will be extinct by mid century. Not surprisingly, the pH is concentrated in the surface, but then over time, so this is a time axis along the bottom, uh, right now, here we are, and as emissions continue to make a more and more acidic surface, that will transmit itself slowly into the deep layers of the ocean. Um, Biological feedbacks to this are not as well understood. Uh, we don't know what species really are going to take over the niches that are occupied by the aragonite species that will become extinct later this century. Uh, we don't know how well they're going to sequester carbon when they do come along. Probably not as well as the firmly established and well adapted species that we have today. I think that's probably pretty likely. So we can expect a pretty different ocean environment. Processes that are implicated uh, in the Permian mass extinction are related to this sort of um, process, as we're going to talk about. And the biggest mass extinction in Earth history was the Permian mass extinction. 95% of all life disappeared. So the ocean's ability to um, well, hold oxygen, to, to have oxygen, to generate oxygen, all of them, really, uh, are also declining rapidly. So the oxygen levels are dropping in the ocean nearly three times faster than climate models had predicted. And there's several causes. This The, the warming, uh, warm water will hold less oxygen. Minerals from the Asian air are covering the ocean, seeding algae blooms, which secondarily affect which have a secondary effect um, of rapidly depleting the oxygen out of the surface waters. And then um, what I hinted at at the beginning, so all this heat that has gone into the ocean, again, there's no way for that to go anywhere except back into the vertical, back into the atmosphere and into outer space. There's nowhere else to dump it. You can't dump it into the deep ocean because the deep ocean is going to mix over long time scales as well and more importantly than that warm water is less dense and it will just rise to the surface okay you, you can't hold warm water down it'll just want to come right back up um, so what's going to happen is we try and cool the atmosphere through geoengineering or whatever ideas we can come up with we're going to have to fight the ocean basically we're going to have to not only cool off the atmosphere, but we're going to have to cool off the ocean, which is vastly more heat. 700 times more thermal capacity than the atmosphere. So it ain't going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult. So there's our key points. And um, this lecture is only one of several that I'll, we'll try and do uh, on the next visit. So I'm going to end this one and we will uh, start on the next PowerPoint, K37. Okay, see you guys next time.